Hello, folks. I'm Davison Koenig, the executive director and curator of the Cal Sharp Historic Site, a two and a half acre campus in the heart of Taos that contains the home studios and gardens of E.I. Kaus and J.H. Sharp, two of the founders of the Taos Society of Artists, and the future home of the Linder Research Center, a 5,000 square foot museum facility now under construction, dedicated to the early art colony in the community of Taos. We would like to acknowledge the Red Willow people of Taos Pueblo, whose ancestral lands we share. Welcome to the virtual panel discussion for our exhibition, Stitched in Sovereignty, Contemporary Beadwork from Indigenous North America. Thanks for being here. Today's discussion with two of the featured artists, Molly Murphy Adams and Kellen Trennell Lewis will be moderated by Dr. Chelsea Herr. Dr. Herr, Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma is a recent doctoral graduate from the University of Oklahoma, where she wrote her dissertation on indigenous futurisms in the work of North, native North American artists. She was recently appointed as the Jack and Maxine Zaro Curator for Indigenous Art and Culture at Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She was also, perhaps more importantly, personally, our amazing intern from the University of Oklahoma Native American Art History Program in the summers of 2016, 2017. And she is the guest curator of our 2020 exhibition, Stitched in Sovereignty, Contemporary Beadwork from Indigenous North America, honoring the 50th anniversary of the return of Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo and their fight for self-determination and native sovereignty. So with that, please allow me to welcome Dr. Herr. Halito, uh, Chipoya Chelsea, Chato Ohoyosia, Yokoki, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Um, as Davison mentioned, the Taos Sharp Historic Site is situated on the ancestral lands of Taos Pueblo, who this year are celebrating what is a still <laughs> an historic return um, of their sacred site, Taos Blue Lake from the United States government. Um, that was one of the kind of driving kind of forces for this show as we wanted to celebrate not just the, the Pueblo's own victory, but really the kind of monumental effect that that had had um, for indigenous land rights and sovereignty since then. And we've been seeing a lot of kind of similar discussions, I think in, in the news and in the Supreme Court this year, so it seems like a very fitting um, kind of tribute to, to their legacy. I'd also like to gratefully acknowledge that I am speaking to you this evening from Tulasi or Tulsa, Oklahoma, which occupies the current and ancestral lands of the Osage Nation and the current lands of the Cherokee and Muscogee Creek Nations. I'm so excited to introduce you to two of the phenomenal artists who are in this exhibition. Um, while the current global health crisis has meant that there have been restrictions on physically visiting the show at the site, our amazing team has provided images and information for the show online at stitchedinsovereignty.org. So even though we can't see you in person, um, I really do encourage you to visit the website. Um, and linked there are also the individual artists websites as well. Um, so please if you can do as much as you can to support these artists, um, especially during this time, even if it's just kind words, <laughs> I think we can all use a, um, a little bit of, of joy and support and encouragement right now. Um, so I really, really hope you get a chance to visit that. So Stitched in Sovereignty highlights the diverse ways in which indigenous, pe indigenous peoples maintain sovereignty over not only their lands and systems of governance, but also their cultures, knowledge systems, and identities. Beadwork itself is a material expression of indigenous sovereignty. While many indigenous communities have practiced forms of beadwork for millennia, it was the importation of European glass beads and steel needles that when it was with the importation of beads and needles that beading became a transcontinental tradition. Tribes integrated these trade goods into pre-existing aesthetic and material traditions, which have persisted for nearly five centuries. The artists featured in the show continue the innovations of their ancestors in expressing personal and cultural identity, in visualizing intergenerational knowledge, and in maintaining relationships with the peoples and the lands that they call home. Through their beadwork, 
they reassert the inherent right of indigenous peoples to shape, reclaim, and re-envision what it means to be native in the United States and Canada today. So I'm gonna give a brief biography for the two artists that we have here with us tonight. Um, and then we have some really great insightful, just short videos that, that they were kind enough to record um, to give us a little more background on their artistic practice. And then after that, I have a few questions for, for each artist and some images of their work that I will share. Um, but we would also love to hear your questions and feedback as well. So please feel free to either drop that in the um, chat box at the bottom of your screen or in the Q&A box. It'll, it'll get to us either way. If you're watching um, from Facebook Live, you can also leave a comment on the Facebook video and that'll get sent to us. So let's start with Molly. Molly Murphy Adams is an exhibiting artist specializing in contemporary sculptural beadwork and printmaking. Molly was raised in Western Montana and earned a bachelor's in fine arts from the University of Montana in 2004. Her work illustrates the blending of culture, identity, and history. She freely borrows from multiple disciplines to create fiber and mixed media art pieces reflecting her diverse background and traditions. So if we could watch Molly's brief video right now, that would be great. Hi, I'm Molly Murphy Adams, and I'm talking to you today from my studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, talking about beadwork and uh, beadwork and what it means to me and how I came to be um, practicing this art form. Uh, for me, beadwork was a practice that I started when I was very, very young, learning from my mother, who had learned from other women in her community. And starting at a young age, making beadwork was how I took my place in my indigenous and native community by becoming a maker of those things that could not be um, reproduced or sourced commercially. And uh, for me, that was a real source of pride and in my community that the beadwork that we made for our cultural um, expression and experiences was something that was just by us and for us. And, um, and as I developed as an artist, um, I didn't consider beadwork to be something that I would integrate with art. I kept those two things very separate until I actually went to art school. And towards the end of my experience at art school, decided that I really needed to uh, integrate um, beadwork and all the other skills that I had learned by doing beadwork, including high tanning and um, parfleche designs I needed to integrate that into art and the way that I loved art to, for all those things to come together and to be cohesive. So that's when I first started incorporating those designs into the fine art that I was making in school and, and finding a way to, to balance those, um, those different inputs and those different inspirations. And, uh, and during that time, I had, I'd always been making my own um, dance regalia for powwows and for my daughter and family and for community members, but I kept that very um, separate. And so bringing the two together has been um, rewarding and exciting. I still do keep a degree of, of separation between the beadwork that I do for what I would call my internal community versus what I, I display externally as an artist. And, um, and that is something that I do to preserve my role as a maker in my community rather than my role as an artist at large. And so I still make moccasins um, and I also keep those things not commodified. I don't charge for them or pay for them. Um, those, are, those are gifts that we ask for and receive and need within our community. Um, the other thing that a, becoming a bead artist did for me is it reconnected me to um, to my mother's tribal culture in a way that was very healing for our family. My mother learned beadwork, and then I learned was able to learn at a young age. And because my mother was given up for adoption, 
um, as an infant and didn't find her birth family until um, she was um, a young woman. And there were other sources of separation in our family. Uh, beadwork is something that connected my mother back to her birth family um, in a really powerful way that we were able to stitch some of those bonds of family back together through the types of important objects that we made for each other and that we appreciated and had a connection to. Um, and so those, that role of being a maker in that regard is, is something that is, um, has been my driving force behind learning how to bead and also a driving force behind why I think it's important to make artwork with beadwork as my basis. It's making artwork that is based in beadwork is certainly not the easiest route. Um, it's not the easiest route in terms of the physical making of an object. It's not the easiest route in terms of um, having representation at galleries or museums or exhibits. And it's not the easiest route in terms of acceptance into the art world, but it is to me uh, a necessary route in order to be authentic to myself and to my background and to my passions. Um, there are times where I've I, you know, wish I did something that was a little faster. <laughs> I haven't been working so incredibly time consuming. Um, but um, in the end, you know, being able to craft the stories that I'm telling through this medium and through the very meditative process of beating um, is as necessary as any other design element that that process of putting beads on a needle and sewing them onto the surface uh, is an absolute necessary element. Um, and it's also something that I feel, you know, personally saved me um, from a background where there was uh, a lot of trauma and neglect. And beadwork was the thing that always grounded me in, in place and time and in purpose and uh, gave me uh, a route into my community that was um, very respected and, uh, and, and gave me that role, which can be hard to do for people who don't have um, deep family connections. Um, and so if you don't have a lot of family connections, then you, have, you need other routes to make your place in the community. Um, so beadwork has, has been that um, guiding star for me, um, since I was first seven years old and picked up a needle and beads and started making very simple necklaces and shapes and, and moved on to doing my first projects um, when I was eight and nine, and then to making my first set of regalia when I was 13. And so that, um, yeah, for me, the repetitive and healing act of beading is what has um, given me a lot of joy and a lot of community and um, and hopefully has given me uh, the means and the way to connect with people and to tell what I hope are powerful stories. So our other artist who is joining us this evening is Cullen Trinnell Lewis, uh, coming from both Nez Perce and African-American ancestry. Kellen aims to increase visibility for underrepresented communities while expanding upon the conversation about identity. He, util he utilizes a wealth of his indigenous crafting knowledge passed down through generations to explore the intersection of tradition and innovation. His works range from handcrafted access accessories and jewelry design to home decor, traditional indigenous regalia, modern apparel, and more. So here's Kellen's uh, look into his artistic practice. Tats lahin lak tua, in wenig was Kellen Lewis, in was nimipu ka tsamuk, ka in was kaulonin haniwat. Good day, friend. My name is Kellen Lewis, and I am both Nez Perce as well as African American, and I am a beadwork creator. I spoke my introduction in nimipu tint, aka the Nez Perce language. Uh, which was my first exploration into the culture and tradition 
of my native people. The second portion of that was learning the traditional arts. I was raised around my great grandmothers, my grandparents, and many aunts and uncles that instructed me on many of our tribe's traditional ways. I learned traditional plateau style corn husk weaving, as well as beadwork, and how to sew both by hand and by machine. These practices, along with others, allowed me a way to connect with our ancestral past. And something that I take great pride in is that it has allowed me a way to continue our traditions for future generations. As far as beadwork goes specifically, beadwork has been a lifeline for me. It allows me a moment to commune with my ancestors, both living and past. When I sit down with a project, I am putting in good feeling and good prayers, good medicine into whatever I'm working on. And in that moment, it allows me time to meditate, to slow down in my day, and to speak with my ancestors. The great part is that on the other side of a completed piece, I get to send out a bit of my heart to whoever the recipient of that work is. As I mentioned, I put so much good feeling and good prayer, so much of my heart into each of my beaded creations. And so when I send that completed piece out into the world, I'm then allowing a bit of me to exist in somebody else's world. And that is something that I am so grateful for. Beadwork is a vocabulary by which I can express my thoughts, my feelings, and it is a method that allows me the chance to really help create change in my world. As I mentioned, I am both Nez Perce as well as African American, and I take great pride in being able to embrace all aspects of my culture and identity. Through my beadwork, I merge my different identities, whether it be my ethnic identities or the dichotomy between the past, the present, or even the, the dichotomy between the present and the future. Whatever it may be, I love to really blend all of those worlds together to help me to express and make a statement for future. With my beadwork, I hope to create visibility for communities that aren't often seen. I hope to share a message that there is a great diversity within Native identities and in embracing my own identities and sharing that with the world that I'm hopefully creating representation for future generations. One of the tragedies that I find in looking in the past is that many of the lenses that documented the past of my people were not that of my people. And so I hope to create that change by being a lens for who I am, for who my Nest Purse people are, and for even who my Black Indians are and Black Americans. What does it mean to come from diverse backgrounds? And what can it mean in processing and expressing the way that you walk in the world? I hope to create change through my beadwork. I hope to create visibility through my beadwork. And I hope to share stories of the diverse landscape of identities that are present in the world today so that future generations may feel comfortable, may feel empowered, and may also feel encouraged to do the same moving forward. I'm so thankful for this opportunity to share a little bit with you all, and I look forward to possible future connections. Thank you so much. Good to y'all. Thank you. 
Okay, sorry. I just made the same mistake that I made five minutes before this started of locking myself out of the mute button. Um, <laughs> so can I just say, first of all, thank you so much to both of you for, for making those videos. I always really enjoy seeing a um, kind of more personal and, and intimate look into an artist's thought process and, and background. And I know that, that our viewers do as well. And also Kellen, it is so hard not to smile when watching <laughs> watching your video and your smile it's like it's so infectious so anytime i'm feeling down i'm just gonna like pull that video <laughs> yeah please do <laughs> um yeah that was really great so i have some images that i would love to share um of the artworks actually up in the luna chapel which if you have never visited the cal sharp historic site um, as, soon it is, as soon as it is safe to do so, you should get there. Um, the Luna Chapel is a, it's a small space, but it is perfect for small exhibitions such as this one. Um, and small in number, not small in, um, I think, significance. I think each of the works in this show um, are so powerful in, in very different ways. They're all so different from one another. Um, but the, the chapel itself, um, and I know Davis and then Michelle and Regina, um, can all kind of, uh, <laughs> sympathize with this. It is not the easiest place to install works, um, sometimes. And so I wanted to start just with a little like anecdote about Molly's <laughs> work here, Beaded High Road Deconstructed, which I was, I was telling Molly before we began has been just a favorite um, for people who've gotten to see the show, the few who've been able to see it in person. Um, but it's it's a very striking piece and it fits so perfectly. Um, this is on the far wall of the chapel, right underneath this this window. The walls of the chapel are, are adobe. And as you can imagine, hammering a nail into them or some, some other mounting system directly into the wall typically doesn't go well. Um, adobe is pretty soft. And so we, we jury rigged this, this system essentially to hang Molly's piece um, kind of all in a line on um, this fantastic hanging system that, that we have installed. But it was so much fun trying to figure out, like, I'm not good at math. So I'm just glad that there were other people there during the install to help. Um, but trying to figure out, okay, how, how do we space these? And then how do we get them to stay that space to that far apart when they, they want to slide down with gravity? So this, this was particularly fun to install. But this work um, of Molly's called Beaded Hide Robe Deconstructed. Um, so this is a kind of an overview, but I wanted to show also a detail up close. So there are individual panels that she is beaded and mounted to um, these canvas kind of platforms um, so that they jut out from, from the wall and create this, this amazing um, sculpture kind of all in one, which is great because they can fit into almost any space. Um, but Molly, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what on earth a beaded hide robe deconstructed means. <laughs> Maybe give us a little bit of, of background on hide robes in general and why you chose to abstract and deconstruct one for such a, um, a striking kind of almost a minimalist piece. Uh, yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna apologize right now for you having to install that on an Adobe wall. Um, as soon as I saw where you had installed it, I just kind of shrank a little bit because I went, oh no. Um, because that requires yeah, on a regular wall, a minimum of two anchor points for each panel, nine panels, that's 18 anchor points. And museums already don't like me for working so modular and putting hundreds of holes in their walls. But um, Adobe especially, and if I'd known you were doing those kinds of suspension rod installation, um, I, I would have truly felt really bad for you. Um, so the idea of a hide robe is that um, it's a, an entire hide that has been tanned and beaded in uh, parallel rows with, with the negative space of the hide in the background and these very narrow uh, horizontal 
rows of beadwork that consist um, usually entirely of just each stitch is a single color. So it's just a progression of, of blocks of stitches. And it's the interplay of those stitches as the color connects over the negative space of the hide in between the horizontal rows that creates a vertical composition. And, um, and I think it's to see one of those original robes is so, um, and, and those robes were usually very special gifts to children or newly wed women or special occasions. So they were marks of, of honor for an important moment. Um, so to see that um, really interesting and advanced interplay of positive and negative space and color, you know, there's a lot of pretty advanced modernism going on in those beautiful specimens. And the repetition and, and the value of negative space is something that is often not um, credited, I think, fully enough mm -hmm. in, uh, in especially early beadwork um, and parflush painting and uh, cornhouse bags. And so that negative space is as important as the positive space. And a contemporary artist that I felt really um, embraces that as well as Donald Judd and that his embrace of the negative space or the space between uh, is as important and integral as anything that he is putting in the space. And so I've played off of Donald Judd's repetitive forms in, in creating these canvases and then, uh, and then created um, my version of some of those parallel rows of color on beadwork on paper and then the paper is mounted a quarter inch out from the front of the panel so that in proper lighting, you get both uh, shadows from the paper and shadows from the panel, um, which is another Judd sculpture type uh, signature move. And then you have the vertical connection of the color as your eye joins them together over the intervening space. And, uh, and this is also very tall and columnar, depending on the exhibition space, it can be stretched out or condensed. And, uh, and each panel is exactly the same number of stitches and the same number of beads. There is no correct order, they're all identical. And so I, I really like working in a modular fashion where um, each individual piece um, might be very simple, but it's through their repetition and their addition of each other and their placement spacing to each other that they become a complex whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sorry about the Adobe. I don't apologize. <laughs> I can't wait to find out what you rigged onto the back of those to make them not just slide like an accordion all the bottom. We'll send you pictures <laughs> of the installation. Um, no, it's it it really was it was fun figuring it out. It was a team effort. Don't you do not need to feel sorry at all. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was wondering, uh, just for the, the sake of time, um, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, could talk a little bit, there are four, I'll show our audience here, um, four pieces of Molly's in the show where she has taken um, photographs on archival paper <clears throat> and beaded atop those. So I, I'm really drawn to this juxtaposition in these various pieces of the kind of both the natural un and unnatural aspects of some of these landscapes um, juxtaposed with that very geometric um, design of the beadwork. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about this particular body of work and, and maybe where the, the idea for this came from. Yeah, I've been, uh, one, of, one of the things that I struggle with in talking about beadwork to audiences is, um, there's some there's some real misinformation about out there about you know what beadwork means what the elements of it mean and how it there's a, a sense that it's just sort of a a, a simple code of you know, this means this and this many these means TP and there's not a lot of um, and people mostly just want to be able to do an interpretation of it this you know that you put it through the you know universal interpreter a la Star Trek and then you get the meaning out the other side. And there's, as though it's just a code of numbers, Roman numerals, and you can get the idea. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of um, individual expression of, of, of whoever is the individual. And then you have that person located in their culture. But then most of all, you have that culture located in a place. And so for me, it was trying to, to connect beadwork to its place. 
And for me, one of the most starting revelations, and I, I'm also very influenced by parflesh design and painting, was to uh, find out that um, parflesh are almost always pictured in a vertical orientation because books are rectangles and yet their use is in a horizontal landscape orientation. And so when you put those parflesh vertically, you lose the literal landscape elements of parflesh. And if you turn parflesh on its side, all of a sudden these elements of buttes and long low horizons with low hills and stuff start to come out and, and you see the landscape of Eastern Montana and South Dakota and Nebraska. And, it's, and it was one of those things that made sense about um, how the landscape comes into those designs. And so for me, the photography was a way to anchor beadwork designs in a physical space, as well as maybe a sense of memory space and a sense of the feeling that landscapes give us and to try to um, implore people to look at that space literally through the lens of these designs and to, and to give that sort of idea also of, you know, this is the filter through which we're seeing our places is through these designs and through the meaning of these designs, both um, culture at large and personally what those designs mean. And so these designs are not just squares or step patterns, but are um, places, objects, mountains, caves, rivers, you know, they're about spaces and about relationships to spaces and events. And so that's, that's my goal with the, is with the photography combining with beadwork is to, is to not just make something aesthetically pleasing. I find them very aesthetically pleasing, the contrast of texture of the matte tone and beads, um, but to anchor designs in place, design in place, always to, to bring those together rather than to separate them out. Mm -hmm. um, especially in historic pieces, I feel like people look at beadwork and they go, yep, those are shoes or those are, that's a functional object. And they, they really almost can't see the pattern for the object. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoy taking the patterns and um, expressing them in new ways. And, and hopefully people can start to see the patterns for the, the real interesting abstract quality they have in and of themselves. That's beautiful. Thank you. And that's, I think that's one of the things that I, I find most compelling about the various beadwork traditions, really, you know, not only across North America, I mean, beadwork is practiced across the world, but, um, you know, speaking about our own little corner of, of the globe here, um, is how much these, these designs and the techniques even themselves, the, the color palettes, um, very often do speak to our kind of emplacement in the world. Um, and I think that that's something very kind of deep and moving that it doesn't often get discussed when we talk about beadwork. And, um, you know, it's, it's from, from my community, which is, was based, our ancestral homelands are in the Southeast of the United States. Our designs are obviously gonna look very different because our environment um, has always looked so different. Same, you know, same for, for Nez Perce. Like there, there's just gonna be these different, or the Northeast, you know, look at Haudenosaunee beadwork. They very much speak to our, our ties to, to land and to environment as well. I think this is a really great way of, of expressing that. I mean, you, you expressed it so much better than I just did. Um, <laughs> all right, Kellen, let's, let's transition over to you here. I'm excited. I'm, I'm just excited about all of this, but um, yeah, I feel I was really enjoying what Molly was saying. I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> mind blown moments. It was awesome to hear. Um, so I I started with with this one. This is a um, compared to Kellen's other two pieces that are in the show. This one is is small, um, but is I think so so striking um, in its smallness, um, and you created it a pretty um th this originally was not going to be in the show right um can you talk a little bit about this there's a similar kind of i think abstraction of design from um maybe the function or or form that that molly was talking about um can you talk a little bit about this piece for us yeah very much so uh it's a small i believe eight by eight inch uh, canvas piece that I painted gold and then I beat it on top of it. So you see a brass stud there in the middle uh, with a large medallion size bead, um, beaded piece in the center. 
And then I also beat it around the edge of the canvas. So the design is kind of, you can see it there on the front. However, it also goes around the edge of the canvas itself. And uh, really with this piece, it was um, a chance to be simplistic. <laughs> For me, this is very simplistic. Uh, and where I was just taking a very um, Kellen approach towards what is a, a nest purse image that I, I want to share. Um, and so, you know, I always love working with my hourglass um, and, and throwing in my stripes, working with my turquoises, my pinks uh, and deep reds. And this is what came out on the other side. Uh, it was just me having fun uh, so that it's functional in that, you know, it's a part of, like I say, home decor of that type of area, something that could be hung on a wall. Um, yeah, it very much alludes to the attire and uh, theater tradition that we have for our regalia. Uh, and so, you know, just very much taking the, the elements that I see in much of our family's traditional regalia uh, and then just kind of spitting it out in my own way uh, so that it can serve as a piece of art on, on somebody's wall. Thank you. Um, yeah, and that, that, you know, gets at what Molly was talking about, I think in, in the video too, of this, um, both a, a separation and at the same time, a marrying of, of beadwork as it is um, kind of historically understood in, in a lot of Native communities versus as an art, you know, the, the more recent and Western understanding, right, of, of capital A art. Um, and I think this, this speaks to that really well. Um, here is another fan favorite, let me tell you. Um, it's a beautiful bag and I actually included kind of two views of this because I wanted people who can't visit in person to see um, how this bag is actually mounted um, and framed on this canvas. Um, and I'm wondering, this is called Stars and Stripes 44. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, the history of, um, well, in the in the plateau, really, of these kind of highly decorated bags um, and kind of their their significance for for people. Uh, yes, this was a direct play on the bags that I saw uh, in our traditional ceremonies at powwows. Um, I saw my grandparents, my cousins, my aunties, my mom, uh, and then just many women of the community have heart shaped purses. And I always adored the heart-shaped purse. It always just, just stood out to me. Uh, of course, there's many uh, large square flat bags as well as round ones, yet the heart shape always just stood out to me. And I focused a lot of time on, on just standard shapes prior to this. And um, there was just something that was drawing me towards the heart shape. I wanted to make a heart-shaped bag, um, just like I had seen many of the women uh, in my community carry. And so this was my play on it, uh, was again, finding a way to honor that tradition of the heart-shaped purse and then to take it forward in a different way. Um, when I thought of a heart, I, I, I was like, okay, love, obviously that's what you think of. Uh, and I didn't know what to put in that, in that shape. And then I came across this image of the Obamas uh, from a photo shoot when they're about to leave the White House and something about it just spoke to me. And so, yeah, that's why I, I threw that into this purse. Um, and yeah, really it, it is just to honor uh, and to find a moment to go down that path. You know, what, what would I do if I had the opportunity to create a heart-shaped purse? How would I express that? Uh, and this is what came about. That's great. And there's something so um, endearing, I guess, about the heart-shaped bag compared to you're saying there, there are, you know, circular and, and rectangular shaped bags as well. Um, and that, I think that imagery fits so perfect, perfectly um, in, in that form. And then um, we'll do last but not least, Beyonce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll get to some of our audience questions. Uh, so this one is called Beychella. Um, and this, this one is, is a bit different too, because you're using a lot of sequins here. And so for, um, 
if you are able to go to the Stitched in Sovereignty website, there is a video where you can get more of the effect because it's so different when you're moving around it, right? Rather than getting a flat two-dimensional static view, it's so dynamic and it changes with every, you know, the change of the light and of the perspective. Um, it looks different depending on where you're standing. Um, so could you tell us a little bit, it was this process of um, a bit different maybe than what you had been doing before to create this piece? Oh, definitely. Uh, with this, I was uh, using sequins as well as beads. So each sequin is placed on there individually. Um, I have a sequin and then a glass bead that sits on top of it to secure it down. So every single sequin that you see in there uh, is individually placed. And this was really a, again, it was something that I saw growing up. I remember one of my aunties had a set of regalia that was fully sequined and it had this beautiful image uh, of this of this man and it, then there's just all this shimmering and shining sequins all around it and and I always loved that uh, and then I, it came to the point where I was like oh my gosh I can I can do this I can make it my own I have the skills now I think I can try this uh, and then it coincided with a cultural event where uh, Beyonce performed at Coachella and at the very opening of her performance she was wearing this beautiful cape that had this image and so, yeah, it was just a marrying of those two things, being able to, to go back to my childhood and, and pay tribute to something that I saw that really inspired me as a kid. Uh, and then to pay tribute to something that inspires me in present day and just to combine them. And so, yeah, that's really the process behind it. Um, everything that you see is all individually placed. And just like you're saying, um, even working on it, it was so great because there's such movement in all of it. And as the light refracts and as it changes its positions, it dances with you. And so it was a very active piece and one that I really enjoyed making. And uh, again, it's just awesome to be able to marry the two, the two worlds coming together, you know, um, reaching back towards the past and then also just making a marker of where are we at right now? This was cre created at the end of 2018, going into 2019. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I look forward to seeing how it will age, you know. She'll age well, I know. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I really, um, you know, I think that one thing that is um, really unique about, about your work compared to some of the other works in the show, which for, for our audience, we'll be talking with two other artists tomorrow evening, if you're able to join us about their work, so you'll get a more kind of full view of, of what is actually included in the exhibition. Um, but Kellen's work, and I think really what you're known for is this like unapologetic incorporation of pop culture, right? Into, into your, your feed work, which shouldn't, to me, shouldn't be like really mind blowing. Like we, as indigenous people, we still participate right, in everything. We still go to Coachella and listen to Beyonce and, you know, love the Obamas. And, um, but there's something about that, that integration, right? Of maybe what people might expect of beadwork, of native beadwork with maybe what they don't expect is that, you know, we're, we're, we're 21st century individuals as well, right? With our own identities and our own um, desires and interests. So, Yes. I think your work speaks so beautifully to that. Well, thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate that. And, <laughs> and that really is such a great summary because that's what it comes down to. Um, I am definitely grateful for all that has been taught over the, over the generations. And it's been awesome to study, even within our tribe, the different trends that you see um, throughout the different decades. Uh, and it's always been a part of that to look out into our environment and to pay tribute to it, whether it's um, portraits of people or of landscapes or of animals and then later coming into the 80s and 90s whether or even before that American iconography when men were returning home from war the eagles and the staffs and, and the <laughs> flags and the stars uh, and then later like there's the Disney characters that you would start to see you know uh, and so it, it really just feels like well this is a way of expressing that in the exact same way it's like making a marker of who we are and how diverse our perspectives are in this very moment uh, to continue the legacy. That's fantastic. So I wanna, we have about 15 minutes of our, our time um, left. 
And we have some, some great questions here I'm going through from um, the audience. There's one that, that I can address directly, um, but from, from Jillian. And she said she, she noticed that the exhibition was um, kind of related to the 50th anniversary of the return of Taos uh, Blue Lake to the Pueblo. Um, how does that relate to the exhibition themes? So in, in the exhibition, um, I, I think I do a little more um, <laughs> clear of a job kind of explaining that when we first started discussing um, this show, it was more about um, where living native bead workers um, come from right now. And these kind of conversations that we're having um, about expressing themselves both as individuals and as members of specific communities um, and as individual artists. And to me, there's a, a, you know, this kind of phrase that often gets thrown around about cultural sovereignty and that's, or visual sovereignty sometimes is used. And it's this idea that um, native peoples should and are entitled to control their own kind of cultural expression. Um, so fighting against ideas of what counts as authentic um, or what counts as quote unquote Native American. Um, and so when we talk about sovereignty, there are so many aspects to it. And it's not just about the political, though that is kind of the, the really the thrust of a lot of conversations, especially right now um, about sovereignty, especially because it has very tangible um, consequences, such as the return of Taos Blue Lake, a, a sacred site to the Pueblo. But for so many indigenous communities, it includes, it's, it's holistic, this idea of being able to determine for yourself, for your community, um, who you are and how you define yourself. It does include systems of governance and it does include um, the rights to, to really to control our own lands and resources, but it also includes these expressions of identity um, and of artistic practice. Um, and I mentioned that the incorporation of imported glass beads and steel needles for me is really an expression of that sovereignty of taking really something that, that can be adapted to your own use um, and creating something so much more um, kind of complex out of it, right? Taking something that already existed. Molly brought up a great example of, of painted hides, right? Of parfleche designs, um, corn husk bags, that these are these have such long traditions in, in a number of communities. And it's not that beadwork replaced them, but I would say rather it augmented those, those pre-existing visual languages and cultural expressions. And so sovereignty really is multifaceted, right? It, it's about self-determination. It's about autonomy. And that can be, um, I think that can be used really in a number, a number of ways. So I hope, I hope that answers. Um, there's a, this is a really great question for both Molly and Kellen. If you could spend a day with one person living or past to get tips or techniques on beadwork, or to ask about pieces they made to get their story and thought process, who would it be and why? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I know who mine would be, and it would be um, uh, um, Maynard Labrador, hmm. White Owl Labrador. Um, and Kellen's probably jumping up and down. Yes, <laughs> she stole mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great one. Uh, just because, um, you know, seeing, seeing his work so many years ago when I first was able to encounter it um, was at, transformative to see somebody who was so, so obviously rooted in, in um, and knowledgeable about historic forms. Um, really, truly had a depth of knowledge that that was obvious, and was obviously an absolute master of technique. Um, but also did just started to do some things that were so innovative and so exciting, and so much an individual who had synthesized all of those things, past and present and future and technique and knowledge and. Um, so when I first started to see his work in books and, and you know, this might not be obvious, but 
pre-internet growing up in rural places in Montana and Idaho and Washington, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of access to our own archives because those archives are in museums and we didn't have access to that. And most of us weren't in academic families. We didn't really know that you could go to museums and ask to see these things and we couldn't study them. And so to finally start to get access through becoming better educated at large, but just to see his stuff just wowed me and told me that there was the possibility to do really exciting things that were also authentic and well done. And those things would take their place in this spectrum of time as, as you know, not just the, the stuff we're using now, but they would take their place as, as objects that would tell our history someday. And so his work is still, I look at it and I still shake my head about how good it is, how perfect it is, how amazing it is. And yeah, there's a few questions I'd wanna ask about how he gets it done. <laughs> <laughs> how does he do it um, and uh because i think i've gotten pretty far along on the technique process but there's still a few things that uh i would like to know how how did he do it yeah oh we'd all God. like to know the answer to that. <laughs> truly yeah it's such a great name i i had exposure um as a kid at one of our nest first cultural camps in Olau, and he came and he presented his artwork <laughs> And I just remember being a young teenager and I was just so blown away. And I was learning to, to weave at that time. And then he even showed some of his, his weaving and it was just, uh, it was so much. And I just remember being like, one day I hope to be that good. Uh, so as soon as you mentioned that name, I just got chills uh, <laughs> because yeah, the, the, just everything you said it so beautifully. So I don't even need to repeat it because it's very much everything that you, you said. Uh, and then I guess just short form for me, um, I would think Ida show away within my family. Um, my grandma has a lot of uh, beadwork from her that came from the early 1900s. Uh, and so, you know, these pieces that have been in my family for over a hundred years, you know, I look at them, I study them and I'm like, oh, just so blown away. So I would love to uh, sit down uh, with her and, and get a real good deep uh, just conversation and, and hopefully it could all be said in Imiputemt in Nesper's language. <laughs> That'd be the, the other part to be able to speak in the native tongue completely. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know, I think both of those answers are really good um, indicators or examples of how significant, not just beadwork, but a, a, a lot of um, indigenous creation and, and making is is a conveyor or a um, like a conduit for intergenerational knowledge, right? Even just sitting around with maybe like your aunties right? and, and doing beadwork, you, you learn so many things in the process of just having community with one another. Um, but then also that the, the knowledge of, of creating such work or of weaving or whatever it might be, um, that, that transmission from one individual to another um, or a group of people is so significant. Um, and I think does, that is one of the reasons why we still have so many um, really vibrant traditions and knowledge systems is because of the maintenance of that intergenerational knowledge that maybe a lot of our material goods did end up in museums where we might not have had access to them anymore, but it's the individuals, right? The makers of those goods who continue that, that um, significance. And for me, one of the reasons why I, th I think beadwork is so important is that while there's lots of art forms that talk about our community and our culture, there is something about beadwork I find so compelling that dispels the myth of, of downtrodden, damaged or subjugated peoples because beadwork is such um, an expression of beauty and of joy and of anticipation and also of, um, an enormous investment of time and material and effort to make something truly beautiful and truly special that to me that counteracts any of those, you know, really um, bizarre stereotypes that, um, you know, that, that you have subjugated downtrodden people. And so when I look at fully beaded dress tops and when I look at moccasin full, you know, beautiful regalia made for toddlers, and I say, those are people who are excited about their future, who really believe in their expression and they believe that what they're doing is incredibly worthwhile and worth investment. 
and to me that is it is hopeful and it is um it is about people who are investing in art and and who have an incredible value on on what those objects bring to their life on the on the added value it brings to them because it's you know it's a lot simpler to just have plain things so to invest this much beauty in, into your objects and into your ceremonies and into your life means that you um, you know you value it and that you have the spare time and energy to express that joy and so for me you know looking at beadwork I it's not just about that it's a, some feat of focus to do all those hours of work but it's you know what does it mean that somebody um, does put 200 hours into making a dress top and, and what does that mean to their whole community to see that how joyful is that for everybody to see that that much beauty um, made by them and for them mm -hmm. absolutely okay we have i want to get in one more question really quick <laughs> before before we're played off the the stage here um so from christina burquist this is a, a great question. Um, we didn't really get into kind of techniques in, in this discussion, um, but she was wondering what types of techniques each of you use or what stitches, um, or do you do bead weaving? I know both of you, the works that are in the show are both, they're all applique, they're, they're stitched onto a, a surface. Um, but could you describe a little bit how that process looks? Uh, I'll yeah, go I mar oh, I was no, you go first. I oh, occupy perfect. so much time. Yeah, I was like, I, you probably have more to say. I, I for me, I, I'm, I'm mostly a two needle beater. Uh, and then, I mean, within a piece, obviously, if something's calling for something else, whether it's a lane stitch, a lazy stitch, or any type of thing, I'll, I'll do that as well. Um, so, yeah, it's really just developing that vocab to use those small little stitches to do um, one other thing that you're trying to accomplish within a piece. However, for the majority of my work, it's uh, two needle applique. I switch between two needle applique and lane stitch, or sometimes what I call contour stitch, where the axis is shifting, um, most normally known in like Santee Sioux beadwork, um, Eastern Dakota florals and stuff. So I call that a contour because it's following a contour usually and changing um, you know, length and, and direction axis and stuff. Um, but I also find that some of those techniques are very different on paper because I'm doing almost all of, all of my work in this show is on paper. And so that has, has brought in some different techniques um, doing almost entirely uh, a lane stitch or, or a lazy stitch, but using um, Pellon interfacing to hold the knots in the back. And then for the photos, especially, uh, padding it out with fabric on top so that I don't scratch the surface with the needle or with my hand or fingernails or, or something like that because that surface is very delicate. Um, but I switch pretty pretty interchangeably between a, a one needle more embroidery technique and then the two needle applique though for florals. Nothing beats it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but just for our viewers, when you're talking about two needle applique, it means you have literally two needles. You have one in each hand and one needle holds the thread where you have your beads strung on it. Um, and the other needle is what you use to tack it or, or you know, stitch it down onto the surface. So you're having to work uh, with the embroidery at once. Mm -hmm. The embroidery term for that is called couching. Okay. So in couching, you have a, a large thread along the surface and then a secondary thread, usually in a contrasting color that um, couches it or holds it to the surface, Okay. but in a raised puffed manner. Okay. So it's, it's a similar technique to that because your, your tacking needle in two needle applique is not going through the beads, it's going over the thread. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little counterintuitive sometimes, but. All right, Davison just popped back on. So I, I think that's uh, <laughs> there. Uh, he's got the, what's it called with the sheep, the hook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pull us off. <laughs> Thank you. I want to say thank you so much to Kellen and Molly and for everyone who who stuck around with us tonight to to talk. Um, I really do hope that that you get a chance to at least look at the, the Stitched in Sovereignty website um, and give a little love to to all of the artists who are involved there. They've been real troopers because this has not been a normal 
experience by any stretch of the imagination. So thank you so much, both of you. I, I really appreciate you and appreciate your work and, and your thoughts. You know, I think the world is a better place because of both of you. We're gonna cover it in beads. Yes, yes, yes. please. More beads. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chelsea. And, uh, and thank you, Molly and Kellen. That was really great. Thank you for sharing so much of your time, uh, your inspiration. Uh, and your expertise with us. I personally thoroughly enjoyed that and learned a whole lot more. Um, I would also like to personally thank all the artists who participated in the show who aren't here with us tonight. Um, thank you so much. Um, it is our hope that by celebrating our diversity and cultural expressions that we become a little more inclusive and compassionate as people. Um, and thank you for sharing all that beauty with us tonight and in the exhibition. And I encourage folks to go to the Sitchin Sovereignty website and spend some more time um, since, since we can't see the exhibition in person right now. So uh, with that, please join us tomorrow night at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time uh, in 7.30 Eastern, where we will be speaking with artists Britt Ellis and Shelby Rowe. Um, so thank you all of you for joining us and um, I look forward to seeing you all in Taos when it is safe to do so. Thanks a lot folks, appreciate it. <laughs>